Well, hey, good morning, family of Grace. Welcome to our online campus. I am the online campus pastor here at Grace Central Coast. We are a gospel-centered, multi-campus church on the Central Coast of California. We are all about helping people find and follow Jesus. I'm so glad to be worshiping with you here today, whether you're staying home because you're not feeling well or avoiding weather, uh, or if you are worshiping regularly at our online campus. I'm so glad to be here worshiping with you. I love to know that I got to do that today. Would you reach out to me? Chris at GraceCentralCoast.org. I'd love to connect with you. I got to connect with new people this week. It was such a blessing for me. I got to meet two people that have been worshiping online from out of the area. They came and visited. I got to meet them in person. It was so cool. So I would love to get to know you online. Uh, You can email me and I'd love to connect with you. We're going to start off our time of worship together today like we normally do by reading from the Psalms. And what we're doing in this moment is we're taking the things from our uh, busy morning, our busy day, our busy week, whatever, and we're bringing them before the Lord and seeing how he's called us to worship in response to who he is and who he's shown himself to be. So we're going to read this Psalm together Um, And I encourage you to read along as I'm reading it, uh, not just for the sake of reading the psalm, but to shift our focus uh, to the Lord today as we worship. So let's do that from Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's worship that Lord right now. Let's profess our hope together. Is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, this solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, our anchor holds within the veil. On Christ this solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He in is all my hope and stay. On Christ, this solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ this solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand.
sing a song uh, that's new together this morning, uh, and it's really new to our online campus, but also uh, a couple of our other campuses as of recent. And as we were, as our team was talking through the book of Hebrews and how they see the book of Hebrews uh, as a whole, uh, we really came to this central thought that Jesus is better. Jesus is better than everything else. And this song says that so clearly in the chorus. Uh, but also throughout the rest of the song, we see Jesus is better than the things of this world. Uh, he's better than our perception, even our, un- even our understanding of him. So let's sing this out uh, in victory in response to who Jesus is, what God has done through Jesus Christ. I 
search the world He couldn't feel me Man's empty praise Treasures of faith Are never enough And you came along Put me back together is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you and there's nothing nothing is better than you we believe that this morning. There's nothing better than what you've done through Jesus Christ. Lord, you have redeemed your creation to yourself. You have total victory. It says you've, you've turned graves into gardens. You have transformed death into renewed life because of what you did through Jesus Christ. We are eternally grateful and we praise you forevermore because of that. You are better. In your son's perfect name, amen. Well, good morning, Grace Central Coast. My name is Jess Jantos, and I'm the Women's Care Director here. And it is such a joy to be worshiping with you online today. I always love when I get to come and do this. So um, we're now transitioning into a time of giving back, and there will be three ways on the screen to show how you can do that. As we do that, we want to just say this is not a time for us to fill with announcements about what's going on in church, but really it's a way to highlight how your giving back impacts every ministry within our 
our church and how that then impacts our community and the world around us. So today we're going to highlight women's ministry, which I happen to love very much. Um, some really exciting things have been happening in our ministry this fall as a result of your giving back. And so we're just wrapping up our fall Bible study. So over the last eight weeks, we've had 170 women across all three campuses, um, both online and in person, uh, studying the story of Elijah and really looking at how his faith was grown through um, his story and how the Lord really used him to impact uh, his world around him. And so that's been really great. We've also been able to have events at each of our campuses. Our Five Cities women gathered a couple weeks ago. Our Slow women just had an event this past Friday night. And our North County um, women will be getting together in early December. So it's just such a joy to see women gathering together again after a year and a half of um, more isolation and restrictions. And um, we're finding creative ways to now be together. And we have one other really exciting thing happening. And this is for women across all of the campuses. We'll be doing a women's worship night on November 18. And this is a time to reflect back on what God has taught us, um, both through our Bible study this past fall, but then also to just reflect and prepare our hearts for the um, upcoming holiday season. So this is an invitation to every age and stage of women um, across all of our campuses. We'd love to have you join us on November 18. So if you want more information on any of these things, or if you want to register for our Women's Worship Night, you can just head to our women's page, gracecentralcoast.org backslash women. And so just a reminder that your giving back has made all of these things possible. Women's Bible study, our um, events happening, our staff, and we're just so grateful for that. So would you join me in praying? Lord, the, um, the lyrics from that last song that Chris just led us in are just sticking in my head, how there's nothing better than you. And we're reminded of that even as we look at the ministries that we're doing across our campuses, Lord, they're all wonderful things that are happening, and yet nothing is better than you. If we don't do it all for your glory, then what is the point? And so may we fix our eyes on you. May the troubles of our world fade in comparison to what you have to offer us in your truth and your salvation, Lord. We pray for this morning. We pray for Pastor Miles as he opens your word and preaches out of Hebrews again, Lord. Would your words speak through him? May you quiet our hearts so that we can hear what you want us to learn this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So we are now going to be doing our scripture reading. So grab your Bible and open it to the book of Hebrews. So we'll be starting in chapter 2, verse 17 and going through 3, verse 6. So Hebrews 2, verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, online campus, so good to be back with you this week. I'm Pastor Miles. I have the privilege of serving here at Gray Central Coast as our North County campus pastor. And I love the online campus. It's been such a blessing to me all throughout uh, our time of having to be at home with our family. And uh, I'm so glad that you are still being able to uh, utilize this time, be in this digital space where you're still connecting with your church family and hearing from God's word. And so, so glad you're connecting with us on the online campus today. Uh, well, when uh, I want to tell you why, why I think that you should leave Gray Central Coast, this church, and never come back. When this church and the leaders of it and the people in it stop focusing on the mission of helping people find and follow Jesus, when we stop 
placing God's word as the final authority of our lives, when we start focusing more on ourselves, our preferences, and our personal needs and desires over the calling to glorify God by making disciples, you should leave. In fact, you have my express permission as a pastor in this church family to do so. But in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, for the glory of God the Father, this local church, Grace Central Coast, so long as it stands this side of eternity, I pray, will always be about helping people find and follow Jesus. Everything we do as a church family is about helping people find and follow Jesus. Jesus. And because of God's calling on my life, I intend to give the rest of my life to that mission in this place should God allow me in his sovereignty to do so. So if as a church we ever abandon Jesus's mission, please leave and you can follow me out the door. But until that day comes and by God's grace, it never will. Let us link arms together as we help people find and follow Jesus on the central coast and beyond. I hope you're ready today because I'm fired up. God's word is living and active for you today and I know God wants you to receive it. Now, you may be sitting there wherever you're watching from and thinking, what the heck was in his coffee this morning? Fair question. I do have really good coffee at home right now. But the reason I started this way is because of how the author of Hebrews introduces the next section of this book. And we read it together already, but let's read it one more time, starting there at chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him and appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. And so what we need to look at there is the consider Jesus part, because essentially it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And our church should be all about Jesus. And our personal life should be all about Jesus. But before we get too far, let's break down this introductory statement because we need to know who the author is addressing because of what is to come. So let's start with that word, therefore. Therefore, meaning because of everything that's been said thus far in Hebrews, holy, that is set apart by God, brothers, those in the family of God through faith in Jesus, not just men, not just the brothers, but all believers, you who share in a heavenly calling, You who were called by God to faith in Jesus. It's not an internal calling from man, but rather an external calling from God to him. So another way to say this introductory phrase that we see there where it says, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, is to say it like this. Because of everything we know about Jesus, those who are set apart by God and called by God into God's family through faith, consider Jesus. Well, why would the author of Hebrews have to write this? Well, we got to remember this, that historical background, historical context is really important here because the author is writing to a primarily Jewish Christian audience. People who, though they've come to faith in Christ, were steeped in the tradition and history of the Jewish people. They knew the stories of the prophets. They knew the stories of King David, Solomon, Jacob, Moses. They were no strangers to the great stories of their great ancestors who came before Even Gentile Christians, those are non-Jewish Christians who began to read the scriptures, which at this time was the Old Testament, would have learned about Moses and these other ancestors of the faith. They They were all drawn to this greatness that they heard and read about. They maybe even aspired to be like them. How many young Israelites do you think had posters on their walls with Moses dunking on Pharaoh? They were drawn to Judaism or back into Judaism. They're drawn to Moses and these great leaders. The author of Hebrews is beginning really what what is going to become a long argument about why Jesus is better than Judaism. And he starts, the author starts with Moses. So like these first century Christians, whether Jewish or Gentile, we too today in the 21st century are drawn to greatness. Whether it be to powerful leaders, sports legends who dominate in their prime, amazing works of art, national parks, or man-made monuments, our hearts leap when we see it. We can't help but stop, admire, and really take it in. Our hearts were made to long for greatness. We do not need to be taught how to praise something great. It's just in our nature as humans. We were created to worship and to praise greatness. And the author of Hebrews knows this and knows also our tendency to make great things out of lesser things. Knowing our desire and longing for greatness, we are pointed to Jesus, the greatest of all. 
And this short section of scripture, just these six verses, communicate one main idea. Fix your eyes on and glorify Jesus, for he himself is your confidence and eternal hope. The author communicates this idea by building on the ideas from the first two chapters. And here in chapter 3, we hone in on arguably the greatest man in the entire Old Testament, Moses. I mean, Moses was the man. Moses led God's people out of slavery and delivered them to the promised land. Moses is the hero of heroes, the greatest of all time. Who could possibly top Moses? And the author tells us only one, and that's Jesus. We're given three actions to take in regards to Jesus, and these will be the the blanks on your outline. If you download that outline from the website, you're filling in those blanks today. I'm going to give them all to you right now. So here we go. Consider Jesus glorify Jesus, hope in Jesus. Consider Jesus, glorify Jesus, and hope in Jesus. So the first is to consider Jesus. First action we we take here from the text is to consider Jesus. So words are really important, and to better understand what the author intends, we need to understand what this word consider actually means. So I don't know about you, but when, when I read this word consider... I think uh, of a possible definition as think about it for a little bit. You know, we use phrases like just consider it, just which kind of indicates to think about it a little bit. You know, just consider it. I think of the word maybe. That's sort of what comes to mind. It doesn't really carry a lot of weight in English when we use the word consider. However, the Greek word for consider is important here because it carries a lot more meaning. And the Greek word is this. It's katanaeo. So wherever you're sitting right now, I want you to say that out loud. It's helpful to say these words out loud. Katanaeo. If you're sitting with somebody else, say it to them. Katanaeo. And it means to direct the mind carefully towards. Direct the mind carefully towards. So it's similar to this familiar phrase, fix your eyes. You may recognize that phrase from the benediction we've been doing during our Hebrew series from Hebrews 12, where it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. So this word consider is a similar idea to that. Fix your gaze on Jesus. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Focus on him. So when we understand that word consider in that way, we see that it has a lot more weight than just think about it or maybe. Here's an example. I've been considering how I can exercise more through mountain biking and surfing on a regular basis. I think about it here and there. But I'm not sitting and deeply pondering the depths of those activities and how they may come to bear on my soul. What the author doesn't want us to do is think about Jesus like that. Just think about a little bit of Jesus here or there and talk about him a little bit or sprinkle him into the preaching or engage with Jesus only on a Sunday morning. We're supposed to direct our minds and therefore our entire lives carefully towards Jesus. We're to ponder Jesus. We're to closely examine and fix our eyes and our thoughts on Jesus. Why are we to consider in such a meaningful and deep way? Well, the author goes on and and tells us, he says, because Jesus is the apostle and high priest of our confession who was faithful to God. And so we continue reading on there where it says, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession who was faithful to him who appointed him. So two, for, two uh, words here, apostle, and then this other phrase, high priest. So apostle, by calling Jesus our apostle, the verse is telling us that Jesus was God's messenger, someone who is sent with a commission. That's what that word apostle means. God's chosen sent one to tell about himself. And in the first century culture, a messenger was to be received as the person who did the sending. So if you sent me to deliver a message for you to somebody else, it was to be received not as me being there, but as if you actually were there yourself. So God the Father sending Jesus as his apostle or messenger was to be received as if God were there himself, which as we know from Hebrews 1 and other places in scripture, he was, that was God in the flesh. And this is so important in contrast to Moses, who was just a mere man. The thing about Moses, though, I mean, think about Moses. He literally talked with God. He literally talked with God. Exodus 33, verse 11. Let's read this together. Exodus 33. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses 
face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Think about the implications of this for first century Jewish Christians. Moses talked to God, literally talked to God. He talked to God. What person can be greater than that? But those early readers and we today are supposed to see Jesus as superior to Moses talking to God because Jesus isn't just talking to God. Jesus is God talking to us. The apostle, the sent one, God in the flesh dwelling with his people, the presence of Yahweh that dwelt in the tabernacle and spoke to Moses as John chapter one, verse 14 says, came and dwelt among humanity. The author is saying, consider this Jesus, high priest. While Moses carried out priestly duties until his brother Aaron took on the official role of high priest, Jesus is the better high priest. So Moses did some of that, Aaron took over, but Jesus really fulfills it all. So we need to remember chapter 2, verse 17 that we read just a little bit ago. And it says this, it says, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, And here it is, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus is the merciful and faithful high priest who made propitiation and atoning sacrifice for the sins of the people. Moses and then Aaron were responsible for making symbolic atoning sacrifices for the sins of the people. Now Jesus has come and once for all fulfilled the office as the great high priest greater than Moses. Now we see why the author wants us to consider Jesus. Jesus is God's apostle. He's God, God's chosen messenger, God in the flesh dwelling among his people. Jesus is the great high priest who has once for all atoned for our sins. That's way better than Moses. Jesus fulfilled all these offices that Moses faithfully served in. All right, that was just verse one, so we got to move. But here's verse two. We see Jesus is faithful to God who appointed him. And this is interesting when we see this. It says, who was faithful to him who appointed him, listen to this, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. So where, where we get this idea, this is Numbers chapter 12, verses six through eight. Listen to this. Let's read this together. Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, that's Yahweh God, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Listen to this. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of Yahweh. The reason that the author borrows this language from Numbers is to elevate the position of Moses. He was faithful as Jesus was faithful. So what's happening here is the other doesn't talk about the failures of Moses, the failures in leadership, the mistakes he made, the sins in his life. He elevates Moses to this really high position. He honors Moses for his faithfulness and service in God's house. And what we're to see here is that Jesus is even higher than that. So as high as Moses may be, Jesus is even higher Moses was faithful, Jesus is more faithful. Moses spoke with God, Jesus is God speaking to us. Moses was a priest for the people's sins, Jesus died for our sins. As much as you consider Moses as a great and faithful servant of God, he is not the one who can save you. Only Jesus can save you. So consider, fix your eyes and thoughts on Jesus. So consider Jesus. Second, glorify Jesus. Jesus. Glorify Jesus. We move into verse 3 and see that while Moses has great glory, Jesus is to be counted as having more glory, and the author uses the analogy of a house to illustrate the point. So let's put our eyes back on the text, back in your Bible. We're going to read verses 3 through 4 together. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus was also faithful, but there's more. While Moses may have been faithful in the house, Jesus built the house. Jesus built the house that Moses served in. And here's what we know from the Old Testament. God created humanity. Within that humanity, he chose the people of Israel. 
Then after leading them out of slavery in Egypt, he put Moses in charge as a faithful servant. Now, what the author is saying is in relation to what we know from Hebrews thus far, within the larger context of the larger story of all of Scripture, is that God built this house, these people, and he did so through Jesus. So what we need to see is that Jesus isn't just one or two levels higher than Moses. Jesus is actually working on a whole other level than Moses because Moses showed up after the house was even built. We see a similar sentiment in Job chapter 38, verse 4. Maybe you're familiar with this passage, but it says this. It says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding, right? That's God talking to Job in Job 38. And what this shows us is that we're not even talking about the house yet. We're talking about the foundations of the earth that the earth would be laid on, that the foundations of the house would be put on, that the house would be built on, that Moses would then serve in. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10. If you go back just one page in your Bible, we read this a couple weeks ago. Verse 10, you Lord... Jesus laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning and the heavens are the work of your hands. Jesus has created all. He has laid the foundations. Where are you at, Moses? You weren't even there because life on earth didn't even exist when Jesus was at work laying the foundations. So it's not that Jesus is just a little bit better than Moses, a little bit higher than Moses, though he is higher. It's not that Jesus is just slightly better than Moses, though he is better. Jesus is the creator of everything. So the readers are seeing it clearly and hearing it proclaimed. Do not look to Moses. Do not look to the law to save you. Do not look to a man to save you. Even maybe the best man to ever live. Don't look to him because Jesus came before him and established all. And then Jesus came after him and fulfilled all. And while Moses may have been faithful in the house, Jesus is the one who built the house. Moses may get glory, but our gaze must be redirected to its proper place. We must glorify Jesus. What does it mean to glorify? It means giving our attention to something. But more than that, it means we're making much of that thing, saying with our actions that it has value and is worthy of our attention and affection and worship. So the author is telling us to glorify Jesus. Jesus, to make much of Jesus, to show his value and worth through our actions. We're also learning here why Jesus deserves this act of glorification in our hearts, minds, and then in our actions. Now, here's a question, church family. What are some things that we, that you and I, find ourselves praising more than we praise Jesus? And I'll tell you mine if you want to get real, all right? It's myself. I talk about myself way too much. It's honestly ridiculous. The things I'm doing, what I'm working on, the things I did that morning. So I took my own advice from the message last week. I took a full break from social media. Deleted all the apps off my phone. Didn't log in once. I cannot tell you how freeing it was to not feel the pressure to talk about myself. I find myself thinking about my Instagram caption as I'm doing the activity that I'm going to post about later. I hate that. That's ridiculous. So I logged out, decided not to post about what I was doing or what my kids were doing. Like, literally, who even cares? Probably my mom, but I'll just call her. So what about you? What do you find yourself praising more than Jesus? What is getting more of your attention than Jesus? And I don't mean your spouse or your kids or your job or school. Not not the things that you have to spend 8 to 10 plus hours a day focusing on. I'm talking about meaningless stuff. Things of absolutely no lasting or eternal value. Your favorite sports team, musicians, YouTuber, hobbies, athletes. Ask yourself that question. What in my life am I praising or glorifying more than I'm actually glorifying Jesus? Then ask the Holy Spirit to help you put that thing in the place it belongs. Far, far below Jesus and what he has done for you. So glorify Jesus. Show his all-surpassing value and worth in your thoughts and your speech and your actions. Consider Jesus and glorify Jesus. Third and finally, hope in Jesus. 
Where does all this considering and glorifying lead us? It leads us to hope. So let's finish reading this section here in Hebrews chapter 3 as we close out with verses 5 and 6. Put your eyes back on the text in your Bible. Let's read this together. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our, conf- our confidence in our boasting and our hope. The author concludes the argument to consider Jesus as better and greater than Moses by speaking again of Jesus' position over God's house. So once again, Moses was faithful as a servant. What was he faithful in? Testifying to the things that were to be spoken later. Moses wasn't it. The law wasn't it. The promised land wasn't it. There was more to come, more to be spoken later. And as we know from Hebrews 1, 1, chapter 1, verse 1, God spoke through the prophets, including Moses, but now he speaks to us through his son, Jesus, the one who rules the house. Moses was faithful in the house to testify of what was to come. Jesus is faithful over the house, not in the house, but over the house and is the fulfillment of what was to come. Verse six, who or what is this house that God has built through his son, Jesus? We are. It says, and we are his house. So it's not the nation of Israel, but rather believers in and followers of Jesus Christ. We are God's house that Jesus has built, the family of God, past, present, and future. And think about this. The Israelites, when faced with their sin, they rested in Moses' faithful work on their behalf. But now, when we are faced with our sin, we can rest in Jesus' faithful work on our behalf. Pastor Darren and I were discussing this week's message uh, on Wednesday evening, and He said it like this. He said, Jesus is faithful over God's house, which means that Jesus is faithful over us. And that's so comforting. That's so freeing. Jesus is faithful over us. Even when we are faithless, he is faithful. And verse six continues on. It says, it says this, we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. If indeed we hold fast, if we're anchored, So that phrase, if we hold fast, gets repeated throughout Hebrews in chapter 4, 6, and 10. And repetition throughout the book stresses its importance. If we are anchored in our hope in Jesus alone. But what's interesting is when we read that, it says, we are his house if. We are his house if indeed we hold fast. So this sounds like we have to do something. This can easily become a spiritual burden if we're not careful. We are God's house If we hold fast our confession and hope, well, what happens when I don't hold fast or I can't hold fast? Friends, I want to encourage you that Jesus himself is our confession and hope. He is our confidence and hope. Even if we aren't holding fast to Jesus, Jesus is holding fast to us. So we have great reason to hope today. We have great reason to have all confidence in Jesus Because he himself is our confidence, our boast, and our hope. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11. Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. 1 Corinthians 1, 31. As it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Colossians 1, verse 27. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus is our confidence, our boast, and our hope. The son who lovingly, mercifully, and graciously rules over the house where we reside now and will reside forever. So first century Christians, don't hope in Moses. He was just a man. 21st century Christians, don't hope in mankind. Don't hope in yourself. Don't hope in science. Don't hope in technological advances. Don't hope in politicians. Don't hope in this nation. Mankind in America are not the saviors of the world. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Hope in Him and in Him alone. He is our confidence, our boast, and our hope. I ask you today, where is your hope? Where is our hope? Our jobs, our money, our portfolios, our kids, their future most likely 99.9999% not going to happen pro soccer career. 
our homes, our Instagram accounts, the opinions of other people. Students that are tuning in today, watching at home, students, hear me today. What people at your school think about you is not the most important thing in your life. Don't make decisions based on that. Don't hope in the opinions of others. Trust me, I went to middle school, I went to high school, and guess how many of those people I still talk to on a regular basis? None. I could give a flying rip what those people think about me now. It doesn't matter. It has no eternal value. Students, the only person's opinion you should care about is the opinion of God. And guess what? He not only thinks about you, but actually knows to be true about you if you're in Christ. He knows you're redeemed. He knows you have the righteousness of Christ. He knows you've been adopted into his family forever. He knows you are eternally loved more than you could ever imagine possible. That is of absolute surpassing worth compared to what your friends at school think about your shoes. Students, where is your hope? Adult, where is our hope? We need to ask ourselves that question this week and then watch our words and our actions because they'll tell us where our hope is. So pray, pray that the Holy Spirit would reveal where we are going wrong and then put those things that we are hoping in, put them in their proper place and put all of your hope in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the only friend who will never let you down He's the only one who knows you completely yet still loves you. Jesus is the only one whose opinion of you doesn't change based on your performance, what clothes you wear, or the vibe of your social accounts. Jesus knows you. He loves you. He died for you. He rose for you. And now he sits enthroned at the right hand of God. Hope in that. Hope in Jesus. Maybe you're watching online today and maybe you've never put your hope in Jesus. Maybe you've grown up in a system of spiritual burdens and to-dos and you've never felt like you just quite measured up. Maybe you feel like God is displeased with you. Maybe you feel like you're not good enough to come to Jesus. Friend, there is rest for you at the foot of the cross. There is rest for you at the empty tomb. There is rest for you because Jesus is the Savior who paid the burden for your sin and in exchange gives you freedom to fixate on, glorify, and hope in Him. He is your hope. You can come today, lay it all down, and be free. In Jesus, you can be free. And if you want to make that decision today to find freedom in Jesus... I know Pastor Chris would jump at the chance to talk to you about that. Send him an email, chris at greatcentralcoast.org. Call the church office. Do whatever you have to do to get a hold of us. Pastor Chris would love to talk with you, talk about what it means to start a relationship with Jesus, to put your hope in him so you can consider deeply, so you can glorify Jesus, so you can have your hope and confidence and boast in who Jesus is. So where are we fixing our eyes? What are we glorifying? Where is our hope? God speaking to us today through the author of Hebrews is giving us the answers. Consider Jesus. Fix your eyes and your thoughts on Jesus. Glorify Jesus. Give him all the praise. Show his value and worth with your life. And when we inevitably fail at considering and glorifying Jesus, we can hope in Jesus, the one who is greater than all, who gave it all, to set us free. As we head into another week of life, good things, hard things, emotions, physical illness, limitations, good jobs, hard jobs, kids, long school days, sports, whatever your week looks like, there are going to be a million things grabbing your attention, diverting your eyes away from Jesus. We'll be tempted to look at ourselves and others instead of Jesus. We'll be tempted to glorify other things or other people than Jesus. We will be tempted to put our hope in temporal solutions to our problems. But friends, we read it clear as day. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Don't hear this as a burden or a challenge or another item for your spiritual to-do list. Hear it and feel it as a burden lifting as you embrace the way of Jesus, as you come to Jesus who is gentle and lowly in heart and whose burden is easy. Fix your eyes for he deserves all glory and he himself is your confidence and eternal hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth in your word today, this 
this incredibly dense, packed passage in Hebrews 3, 1 through 6, that's really all about how great Jesus is, how amazing and how much mightier Jesus is than even the mightiest of your servants, Moses. God, I pray that you would empower us through your spirit this week to consider, to think deeply, to ponder, to direct our minds and our thoughts toward Jesus, that that in turn would lead us to glorify Jesus in the way we speak and talk and act and move. And God, I pray that even when we fail to consider, even when we fail to glorify, that we would know, that we would rest in the fact that Jesus is our confidence. Jesus is our boast. Jesus is our hope. And even when we're faithless, he's faithful. God, may that become real to us. May we feel the burden lifting as we come to Jesus this week. We thank you for our time in the word this morning. And we pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen. Well, here's two simple next steps this week. Okay, they're simple, not for lack of thinking of something more robust, but because I truly believe this is what I need this week and what you need as well. Here's two, two quick next steps. One, listen to Jesus speak to you through reading his written word, okay? Listen to Jesus speak to you through reading his written word. Read it, you have it, read it, and then pray. If you want to make it even more simple, read and pray. Listen and pray. Talk with God through his written word. Hear from him and then talk with him in prayer. God will meet you in his word. God will meet you in prayer with him. I need that this week. You need that this week. It's not a spiritual to do. It's a burden lifting, hope inducing privilege to listen to God and to talk with God. Let's take advantage of it together this week as we hope in Jesus. It's been a joy to be here with you on the online campus today. Pastor Chris is going to come and close our time with our benediction. Thank you so much, Pastor Miles. Yeah, that was really bold of you to say that I would love for you to reach out to me, and it's true. I really, really want to talk to you about Jesus. I get to do that with someone today, and I'm so excited. So please, reach out to me. I would love to talk to you about uh, the salvation that we find in Jesus Christ and the, the light burden that comes with that that he talked about. Thank you so much, Pastor Miles. Hey, I got a couple things going on uh, here at Grace. Uh, I wanted to let you know, uh, people have mentioned to me they miss being at our physical campuses and they want to hear more about what's going on. And I want to give you a chance not only to hear about what's going on, actually get involved in this way. If you've been at our slow campus at all, you might know that we have a ministry called God's Storehouse. Um, and so we have this thing annually called the Thanksgiving Grocery Giveaway. And what we do is... Uh, we gather like extra food, extra grocery to give away to the clients at God's Storehouse, but also to uh, everybody else, anyone who comes and needs groceries. And so this is a huge event for God's Storehouse, and you can get involved in two ways at our online campus. One, um, you can go to gracecentralcoast.org slash community care, and you can register there. You can uh, donate towards this specific thing, and we will go out and shop for you if you don't feel comfortable coming out. Or... Um, if you've been looking for an opportunity to come back to our physical campuses, this is it. You can buy groceries and drop them off at the Pete's property over the next couple of weeks. You can find details about that online. Also, uh, we have uh, a growth group, an online growth group. I've been waiting to announce this, and I'm so excited. And so we have a growth group that's going to start meeting next week. Now you are without excuse. There is a community that you can join online, and you can um, work with other believers to be challenged and encouraged together. Please email me if you want more details about either of those things. Our last thing today, I wanted to let you know that Rich Madem uh, went to be with the Lord this week uh, on Monday. There's going to be a Celebration of Life Memorial on Saturday, November 13th at 11 a.m. at our downtown Slow campus. If you knew Rich or not, uh, I encourage you, come out to that time, um, celebrate his life with that family. With that, why don't you all stand wherever you're at? We're going to read with and to each other God's word. And this is a way that we uh, send each other off into the week. Um, because uh, I've, I've said this before, our, what happens on Sunday morning, our gathering, is not the total of our church experience or our Christian experience. And so we're going to send each other off with these encouraging words. And we're going to continue doing life together and glorifying God throughout the week. Let's read together from Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, 
who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Have a great week. Hi, kids. I'm Emily, the Kids Coordinator at the North County Campus at Grace Central Coast. Today, we're going to sing some songs, listen to a Bible story video, and hear some questions from kids. So let's get started. Hey kids, welcome to Sing Along Songs, the part of the show where you sing along while we sing a song. Today I brought a friend to help me along. Today I brought a friend to help me. Hey, what's your name, sir? My name's Bernard. Bernard, are you excited to sing with us today? No, not really. Well, we're going to give it our best shot for the kids, aren't we, Bernard? We'll see. All right. This song is called Kangaroos Like Me. All right, let's learn it together. I like kangaroos, they're a lot like me. There's no animal that I'd rather be, not a bird in the sky or a fish in the sea, just a kangaroo for me. Kangaroos are amazing, truly a wonder. They don't live on the central coast, but way down under. They got lots of hair, and so do I. What? They can hear really high, but my kangaroos are a lot like me. There's no animal that I'd rather be, no bird in the sky or fish in the sea. Say. Just no kangaroos for me. Kangaroos don't go to the gym. What? No time for that. I guess so. They're really strong anyway. So get off my back. Huh? Kangaroos look naturally cool. Told me the same one time back in 05. That was a mistake. Like kangaroos, they're all like me. There's no other animal that I'd rather be. Not a bird in the sky or a fish in the sea. Just no kangaroos for me. What other animal can hop, 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 What other animal can kick, 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 kick? What other animal can pay off their student loans? And their crumpling debt. All right, thank you, Bernard. God had chosen Abraham to be the father of a large family, a great nation through whom God would bless the entire world. Abraham was 75 years old when he obeyed God's call to go to a new land. He left his home in Haran with his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all of his possessions and servants. They traveled to the land of Canaan. God reminded Abraham of his promise. Abraham and Lot moved throughout the land. Finally, Abraham decided to separate from his nephew Lot because the land could not support all of their people and animals at the same time. So Lot chose where he would live near a city called Sodom, and Abraham went to Hebron. In those days, four kings in the area got together and fought a war against five other kings, including the king of Sodom, where Lot lived. In the end, the four kings won against the five. Their armies took everything, all the goods and people, from the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The kings even captured Lot and then went on their way. One survivor found Abraham and told him what had happened. Abraham gathered together 318 men, and they went after the four kings. Abraham's small army attacked the kings and their armies at night, defeated them, and chased them off. Abraham brought back Lot, many possessions, and also many people. When Abraham returned from the battle, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, came to Abraham. Melchizedek was a priest to God Most High. Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, God has blessed Abraham. Let everyone bless God, who created heaven and earth, because he has handed over Abraham's enemies. Then, Abraham gave Melchizedek a gift one-tenth of everything he had. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Melchizedek reminds us of Jesus, an even greater priest and king who lives forever. Jesus died on the cross and rose again to bless all who trust in him by providing forgiveness and eternal life. Hi, hi. 
Hi there, I'm Pastor Kevin. It's time for questions from kids. Maria from Decatur, Alabama ask, Does God bless everyone? Oh, Maria, that's a fabulous question. In short, the answer is yes, the Lord blesses everyone. The Lord blesses us with his with this common grace. You see, the, the scripture tells us that it rains on the, on the just and on the unjust. And Maria, I consider that a blessing. The Lord makes his, his sun to shine on the just and the unjust. And frankly speaking, the sunshine is a blessing. Maria, what we have to be very careful of is when we read through the scripture, not to try to apply every blessing and every promise in the scripture to our own selves. Because the Lord gave specific blessings to specific people who were doing a specific task that he had called them to do. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, how can we be a blessing to other people? You see, the Lord has given us gifts. We see this in Romans chapter 12. We see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We even see it in the passage that we're reading now. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we take the gifts that the Lord has given us and how can we be a blessing to other people? So often we look at, oh, will the Lord bless me? Will the Lord give me a gift? Will the Lord will the Lord do this or that for me? And that's not wrong to ask the Lord to bless you and to take care of you. But the Lord is pleased when we use what he has given us in order to bless and to care for other people. You see, in the Beatitudes, Maria, the scripture tells us what it means to be blessed. And so I would encourage you to read through the Beatitudes and see what the scripture has to say about, about being blessed and about being a blessing to other people. So maybe a good question is, how can you be a blessing to others? Hey kids, wow, what a great lesson. What a great episode. What a great time to be alive. Let's uh, finish with the song we always finish on, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Uh, how, how about we do it super slow this time, Josh? That sounds great. All right, here we go. One, two, three, four. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your you know what, let's do it super fast now, all right? Whew. All right, I don't know if I'm ready. You got it, you take it away. Ready? <laughs> One, two, three, four. Trust the Lord with all your heart, only not on your own, and understanding all your ways, and all your ways, and all your path. Boom, perfect! Hey, we'll see you later, bye. We're so glad you joined us today. Again, I'm Emily, the Kids Coordinator at the North County Campus. Our Kids Ministry team at Grace Central Coast is committed to helping your kids find and follow Jesus and committed to helping you disciple your kids. For further resources or to contact us, go to gracecentralcoast.org. Have a great day.